Welcome to our session looking at the trend in melting points of period 3 oxides. I've sketched a little graph here, a very rough scale of uh, melting point MPT uh, and that K there is for Kelvin. And we're going to look at the melting point of sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus and sulphur oxides. So the first one we're going to look at is um, uh, the melting point of sodium oxide and of magnesium oxide. And you can see from uh, the graph here that they're significant, very large, uh, very high melting points. Uh, sodium oxide is about 1400 Kelvin, uh, going up to over 3000 Kelvin for magnesium oxide. So these are extremely high melting points. And we'll see uh, in a minute why we, would, uh, why we uh, expect these to be so high. Um, we would expect using an understanding of the ionic bonding taking place between sodium oxide uh, uh, between the ions in sodium oxide and magnesium oxide that aluminium, aluminium oxide would have an even higher melting point than magnesium oxide uh, it still has a very high melting point uh, but it's not as high as we would expect and we find it's a little bit little bit below uh, two and a half thousand Kelvin um, so Al2O3 is our aluminium oxide there these are our metallic oxides, they are all ionic oxides. We'll uh, deal with explaining what we mean by that and why they have these high melting points uh, in a moment. We're then gonna move to our first non-metallic oxide, which is silicon uh, dioxide. Um, and that actually has uh, um, still a very high melting point, but below 2000 um, of, and that's our formula for silicon dioxide there, which is SiO2. Um, then we come to our purely molecular non-metallic oxides, phosphorus oxide, P4O10 is down here, and then sulfur dioxide is going to be very, very low indeed. Uh, we also need to talk about sulfur trioxide, uh, which is going to have a melting point a little bit higher than sulfur dioxide. Okay. So let's break our graph into uh, metallic oxides and non-metallic oxides because this not only allows us to explain physical properties, it will also help us to explain chemical properties. So let's deal with the metallic oxides and I'm talking first of all about sodium and magnesium oxide. Well, they're made of ions and it's easiest to talk about the Mg uh, magnesium oxide. So we've got an Mg2 plus ion and an O2 minus ion. So that's our simplest ratio of ions. Obviously, don't forget that we're actually talking about molar quantities of ions. And there are going to be extremely strong electrostatic forces between the ions. Now, if you're talking about this, if you're writing about this, then we can use the word magnesium or we can use Mg2+, but we must state that it is an ion. We can use O2- or we can use oxide and we must state that that is an ion. It's very important that we don't say oxygen ion, oxide ion and magnesium ion. So as a result of these strong electrostatic forces, they're going to take lots of energy or lots of energy is required to break So lots of energy is required to break the strong attractive forces. That means we're going to have very high melting points. Now, why do we have this trend first of all from sodium oxide to magnesium oxide? Well, it's simply due to the fact that the sodium and the magnesium ion are almost identical in size, but Mg2 plus has uh, uh, greater charge than uh, Na+. So uh, we have stronger electrostatic forces and that's because we've got a 2 plus ion versus a 1 plus ion. From that we would expect aluminium oxide to have an even higher melting point. We'll see later through the course that that isn't, isn't true, 
because uh, aluminium uh, uh, oxide is not uh, completely ionic. So there is um, some other uh, bonding going on which affects that melting point. All we need to be able to do is explain the difference between those and also explain the relative magnitude of the fact that these are ionic substances. So we're going to label the, all of these uh, 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 metallic uh, oxides as ionic and it's very important that we, uh, whenever we start one of our answers, we state that, they're, uh, that they are ionic oxides. And that these ionic oxides form a giant lattice. Okay, let's look at, look at our non-metallic oxides. The first one is silicon dioxide, which sort of st stands out here as um, a bit of an outlier. So SiO2 has a giant covalent structure. So it's a giant structure, much like um, the giant ionic lattice was, but this time it's a giant covalent structure. Now SiO2 would make you think that each silicon is bonded to uh, two oxygens, and well, if we think about it as a molecule, it is, but when it forms this giant structure, each silicon is bonded to four oxygens tetrahedrally. This doesn't look too dissimilar from the giant lattice that we see in diamond. Okay, and I've just drawn parts of it there, but obviously this is a giant structure that keeps going. So it has very strong covalent bonds. And these require lots of energy to break. Um, well, I should actually say that there obviously we've got lots of very strong covalent bonds uh, and these require lots of energy to break. So let's finally have a look at our three remaining ones here. So let's get a bit of space on my paper. Um, these three are simply molecular oxides. Our molecular oxides have weak van der Waals forces uh, between the molecules. So I've written that really badly there. That should say van der Waals. So we've got weak van der Waals forces between the molecules. Uh, these require relatively little energy to break. Why have we got the trend between these two? Well, if we think about it, P4O10 has more electrons than SO2 or SO3 uh, and therefore has uh, stronger instantaneous dipole, induced dipole forces. Um, obviously remember that instantaneous dipole, induced dipole is the way, is the way we explain van der Waals forces and is another way uh, of describing those. So let's have a review of what we have looked at so far today. We've got our three metallic oxides. Uh, they form giant ionic lattices or lattices. Um, we've got strong electrostatic forces between the ions. These require lots of energy to break these strong electrostatic forces leading to a high melting point. We need to be able to explain that magnesium oxide has a higher melting point than sodium oxide because of the greater charge on the magnesium ion. That, um, that model doesn't hold completely true for aluminium oxide because it's not fully ionic in character. We've then got SiO2, 
silicon oxide, which is a giant covalent structure. Um, in it, each silicon is bonded to four oxygens, uh, and the oxygens obviously are bonded to two, two silicon uh, uh, atoms. This leads to lots of very strong covalent bonds as a giant covalent structure. These require lots of energy to break, therefore the high melting point. And then finally, we have our molecular oxides, phosphorus oxides, and the two sulfur oxides that we need to know about. Um, these have weak van der Waals forces between the molecules. They require little energy to break. We can explain that phosphorus oxide has a higher melting point than sulfur oxides because it has more electrons and therefore uh, stronger instantaneous dipole induced dipole forces. Thank you very much.